<clears throat> these and more partner organizations will be a big influence on the moving uh, forward of all these initiatives that we'll be talking about over the course of these events. So as I mentioned, this is the first event in a series of three online events that are scheduled to take place over the coming weeks. The next event is scheduled to take place on May 27th at 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Some, uh, it's going to have the same kind of format we have as for this meeting tonight, a Zoom meeting, three hours, uh, but our topic will be local community investment strategies. We have Michael Schumann, economic developer and author of many books, including The Local Economy Solution, and Stephanie Bush from the Community Development Sustainable Solutions of East St. Louis. Um, the link to the registration for that event is already up on the metroeast.climateeconomy.com. Com. Metro East dot the climate economy dot com is where we find all the information about all these events. And um, the third event expected to be June 10th will focus on clean energy and we'll have representatives from the Midwest Renewable Energy Association and the Grow Solar Metro East. And of course, we want to acknowledge everyone out there right now suffering through the hardships of this coronavirus epidemic. We dedicate our efforts here today to everyone's health and wellness. I also want to thank again all the sponsors and organizers of this, these events, as well as the presenters and panelists. So a few housekeeping items. Um, first of all, if you're not talking, please make sure your microphone is off. Um, and the way this, is, this will work is that we'll have two presentations followed by question and answer sessions for each speaker. And if you want to leave a question, you can write it in the Q&A box. You should have a Q&A box that you can bring up and add your question and we'll either uh, answer it live or answer it over the chat there. Um, and then we'll have the panel discussion after that. And if you think of questions, again, please put them in the Q&A box there. Um, we'll do our best to get to them. And at the end, I'll be talking about the Climate Economy Action Network, which is an online community where we can build and grow climate ventures. So we'll try to keep to the schedule as much as possible. If you have a problem or need other help, just use the chat. If for some reason the meetings ended early, um, if we lose internet connection or something and everything goes blank for everybody, um, I'll just set up a new meeting real quick and send out an email message to everybody. <laughs> I've never had that happen, but just in case. Um, okay, so our goal with these kickoff events in the Metro East is to get new climate ventures going. Climate ventures, of course, are businesses and lifestyles that are good for the climate, economy, and humanity. With that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, L. Hunter Lovins. I'm extremely honored and excited to have Hunter here with us today. She is the president and founder of Natural Capitalism Solutions, a nonprofit formed in 2002 in Longmont, Colorado. She's a renowned author and champion of sustainable development for over 35 years, and she has consulted on business, economic development, sustainable agriculture, energy, water, security, and climate policies for scores of governments, communities, and companies worldwide. Within the United States, she's consulted for heads of state, departments of defense, energy agencies, and hundreds of state and local agencies. Hunter's book, A Finer Future, An Economy in Service to Life, was an inspiration to me personally that led to me forming my nonprofit, The Climate Economy. So I'd like to thank her again very much for being here today, and I'd like to hand it over to you now. Amy, thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen and run through a set of slides to talk about some of what's happening in agriculture and in the climate challenges that we face, and then what we can do about it. So bear with me a sec while we get this done. As you've no doubt noticed, our world is changing. COVID is going to be much worse than we now think, but it is not the end of the world. These aren't the end times. We will get through this. Humanity has gotten through a number of crises before, but this is perhaps our homework or our test 
because there are far worse crises facing us. Food right now is in some crisis. There's five companies that control almost all of the meat production in the country. They have employees falling sick with COVID. The supply chain is breaking down. This means there are hundreds of thousands of pigs, chicken, cattle that cannot go through slaughter in the normal way. And what are, what's a farmer to do? We have designed a system that is so fragile that if you have a pig that's too big, it can't go through the processing plant. A chicken that's too big, it can't go through the processing plant. So farmers are saying, we're just going to kill them. And at the same time, store shelves are bare. We're starting to run out of meat in the grocery stores. There's plenty of meat. Farmers have the food. It is the system, the supply chain, that is bending and breaking. And this is not the only emergency that we're facing. The climate crisis is going to be much, much worse just than, than this little virus. The bomb cyclone that hit Colorado uh, a year or so ago killed a lot of cattle, and then it melted and headed east, flooding much of the agricultural heartland. Farmers couldn't get into the field to plant. And we had it easy. Cyclone Day that hit Mozambique, first such hurricane to go that far north, left thousands of people dead. They still don't even know how many people dead. Scientists tell us that perhaps as early as 2040, the Middle East will be too hot to be inhabitable. Where are they going to go? Scientists also tell us that just renewable energy, energy efficiency alone is not enough. We need to start taking carbon out of the air and putting it back into the soil if we are going to deal with this climate crisis. And if we simply increase soil carbon, 2%. This would offset all of the carbon emissions that humans emit. If we increase it more, then we're starting to roll climate change backward. And as I will describe to you, we can do this profitably. We think we're here because of this big brain of ours. We're not. We're here because of six inches of soil and the fact that it rains. And yet agriculture as practiced today is itself in peril and is imperiling life as we know it on the planet. It is very fragile. Lester Brown points out that one bad harvest globally and we're looking at famine. And indeed with COVID and the breakdown in the agricultural supply chains, we have famine with us right now today. Even before COVID, much of the world is at risk of food scarcity. Remember, it was a food riot in Tunisia that kicked off the Arab Spring. This is Mohamed Bouazizi, who was a bread seller. He couldn't afford wheat, and so he burned himself to death. That then kicked off the Arab Spring, which led to the Syrian Civil War and to violence all across the north of Africa. At the same time, we are losing farmland. The per capita farmland, that's the farmland available per, per person, is shrinking. Now, the land's not shrinking, but the available land, because of the spread of urbanization, conversion of farmland into other uses. In the United States, something like 40% of our farmland is leased or owned by other people. And who would you rather have growing our food? The bankers on Wall Street or the farmers who grew up on that land and hope to pass it on to their children? Agriculture today is unsustainable. In the 1940s, we 
produce 2.3 calories of food for every calorie of input of energy. Now it takes 10 calories of input to produce one calorie of food. We've become mechanized, energy intensive, water intensive. Agriculture as currently practiced uses about 70% of the world's water withdrawals and we're polluting that water. Runoff from farm fields where farmers are using fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, is going into our rivers and it's taking the soil away. And we know how to do it better. Sustainable agriculture builds soil. It minimizes the use of artificial inputs, in part because these are costly. And it uses a whole system approach to farm management. I'm fond of the use of the phrase regenerative agriculture. Bob Rodale, who uh, founded Rodale Institute, was concerned about a lot of the baggage that went along with the term organic agriculture. So he coined this term regenerative agriculture to be a kind of farming that improves everything that it touches a holistic approach that encourages continual on-farm innovation for environmental, social, economic, and spiritual well-being. Vandana Shiva, the great biochemist from India, says regenerative agriculture is the solution to the challenges facing us, the soil crisis, the food crisis, the health crisis, the climate crisis, and the crisis of democracy. Here's what we're talking about. If you manage land, and <laughs> Mark Betterman of the uh, New York Times says, uh, it's, it's wrong to call it conventional agriculture because the way we've done agriculture for millennia was actually halfway sustainable. Industrial agriculture takes carbon out of the air, Holistic agriculture, regenerative agriculture, takes carbon from the air and puts it back into the soil. Much of this comes from the work of a man named Alan Savory, who has observed how grazing animals on the grasslands of the world have been improving the grasslands, and the grasslands co-evolved with grazing animals over the millennia. In our country, the bison, dense packed because there were wolves. If you're about to get eaten, the safe place to be is in the middle of the herd. So these vast herds of grazing animals all across the Great Plains ate everything in front of them, trampled everything underneath them, fertilized everything behind them. And this is what built the 10 feet of thick black soil that the pioneers found when they first came across the Great Plains. Today, we don't have the great herds of bison and we don't have the wolves, but we can dense pack cattle using the opening and closing of water holes, electric fences, and get exactly the same impact of taking carbon from the air, putting it back in the soil, and enhancing the fertility and the profitability of our land. This is a shot from Wyoming. Looking north on the right, looking south on the left, same day, standing on a bridge, everything to the south is managed regeneratively. Everything to the north is the ordinary way of just turning cows loose and not worrying about where they go. The regenerative management enables the ranch to have a 260% increase in stocking density. You think that adds to your profitability? South Africa, same thing. Everything on the right is ordinary management. Everything on the left is regenerative management. And you can see the difference in how much grass there is. You can turn cows out on desert land, feed them, and get bioremediation. You can do this on acid mine tailings. You can turn the cows out, feed them, 
and you get grass back where for years they had tried to do hydro seeding. Everything on the right is where they hydro seeded, everything on the left is where they used cattle to bioremediate. Savory Institute is working to regenerate a billion hectares of land with a hundred hubs. These are ranches, farms, where people study this approach and are willing to teach it to their neighbors. Patagonia is getting into the act with beer. This is long root ale made from Kernza wheat grown at the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas, where Wes Jackson and his colleagues have been experimenting with perennial polycultures of grains. Marty's holding up a Kernza plant and you can see how deep the roots are. This is what takes the carbon deep into the soil. The wheat next to it, the little shallow roots, that's what, uh, that's most of uh, the wheat that we eat. Will Harris, White Oak Pastures in Bluffton, Georgia. Will's a fifth generation cattle farmer who just didn't like the way his business was going. And so he switched to regenerative agriculture. He now runs 2,500 acres of ground with 137 employees. His neighbor commodity peanut farmer runs 2,500 uh, 2, acres with four employees. As a result, the little town of Bluffton, Georgia is coming back to life. This sort of agriculture is more labor intensive, but less capital intensive. And so it's good for rural health, rural community, economic development. And Will is very profitable. He produces five kinds of pastured red meat, poultry, eggs, organic vegetables. What Will says is he has de-industrialized agriculture. He built his own abattoir, his own slaughterhouse, so that he could ensure that the animals are humanely treated. He does mail order, and now of course he can't keep up with demand. He's in Georgia, he sells as far north as Whole Foods in Chicago. Meet Gabe Brown. Gabe is a North Dakota corn soybean commodity farmer who was going broke. Because he was going broke, he said, I'll try anything. First, he went to no-till. He stopped breaking the soil. Then he planted cover crops, then deep-rooted cover crops. He's now profitable. He is producing at, say, Buck 35 selling at 350. He's doing mail order as well. And again, now in the times of COVID, he's working hard to keep up with demand. What Gabe says, soil carbon is the key driver for the nutritional status of the plants, therefore the mineral density in animals and people. It's the key driver for soil moisture holding capacity. It's the key driver of farm profit. And here's some of his data. He tried running this approach, fertilizing and not fertilizing. He gets higher yield without fertilizer. And he says he's not the most productive farm in his region, but he's more productive than most of his neighbors and his costs are vastly lower, and so he's much more profitable than his neighbors. He's able, without putting any artificial inputs, nitrogen, potassium, to have higher nutrient density in his soil than his neighbors that have to pay for the artificial inputs. What he has found is if you ranch farm regeneratively, the land provides the nutrients that you need. And here's where it gets really fun. Gabe has been adding soil organic matter, carbon. He started with a little under 2% soil organic matter. 
He's now over 11% on, on some of his pastures as high as 15%. 1% soil organic matter is about five tons of carbon. Gabe is rolling climate change backward. He also is now selling a diversity of products, which enables him to be profitable regardless of what happens with weather, with commodities markets. If you want to know more about what Gabe is doing, there is a great video, Keys to Building a Healthy Soil, in which Gabe walks through what he's done. You can also get his book, Dirt to Soil, where he describes the journey of his family from near bankruptcy to now profitability and a great life. You can also go on his website, Nurtured by Nature or Brown's Ranch. Now you say we can't feed the world with these kinds of small operations. Actually, the UN would beg to disagree. UNCTAD has put out this report. UN Food and Agriculture Organization has said the same. Small holder organic farmers are now what feed the world. 70 to 80 percent of food in the world is now produced by smallholder farmers. And if we help them with the best of regenerative management, their profitability can go up, their productivity can go dramatically up, and this is what it will take to feed the world. Here's an example from Zambia where Sebastian Scott is using pigs in this little container which they pick up and move to where the pigs can eat the grass. And they move it up and down this farm, planting behind it in the manure that the pigs have deposited. He is, he's increased his soil organic matter to 2.5% from roughly 0.5%. And again, 1% soil organic matter is five tons of carbon. It is also 20,000 gallons of water holding capacity. So this kind of an approach enables farmers in areas that are threatened with climate change, threatened with drought, to be much more resilient. This approach is championed by a group called Soil for Climate, you can go on their website, soil let, number four climate, and get a whole set of technical scientific reports that document these assertions. Now the big boys are getting in. Industrial agriculture is beginning to realize, and the big commodity consumer products goods companies are realizing that regenerative agriculture has a lot to offer. So General Mills has committed to helping farmers on a million acres of ground switch to regenerative agriculture as the way in which they are going to offset their carbon emissions. Microsoft said not only are we going to be carbon neutral, we're going to be carbon negative by 2030. We are going to soak out of the air and put into the soil as much carbon as our company has ever emitted over its lifetime. And not to be outdone, Jeff Bezos of Amazon said, well, I'm going to spend $10 billion. Microsoft says it's going to put a billion in. I'll put $10 billion in. Now, he has no idea how he's going to spend it. But we are beginning to see real money being committed to what's being called carbon farming, or more simply, regenerative agriculture. We also need to bring this into the schools. We need to bring this to people. And Chef Ann Cooper here in Boulder, Colorado, has been working with the school districts to do gardening on school properties teaching the kids about how, where food comes from, and then setting up cooking programs and nutrition programs with school lunches so that kids not only understand what agriculture is, where their food comes from, 
they're being fed healthy food. In the Bronx, Stephen Ritz, school teacher, is growing vegetables with children in one of the poorest school districts in the country. He started doing this because he needed something to capture the attention of his kids. And it turns out that growing food was of great interest to them. He has increased student attendance from 40% to 90%, created 2,200 jobs. He's feeding the neighborhood. And he's teaching the kids where their food comes from. You can do this at home. You can take your lawn and turn it into a garden. You can do this on a global scale. If we are going to meet the challenges face humanity, we're going to have to transform how we do agriculture, how we take care of the land. And on those policies rest all the rest of the sustainable development goals how we're going to meet the needs of humans around the world. Renewable energy, energy efficiency is very important. And we know now how to meet all our energy needs from the sun, with wind, with flowing water, with biofuels. These are now cheaper everywhere on earth than oil, gas, coal, nuclear. And as a result, they're winning. Companies like General Electric, GE walked away from a perfectly good natural gas plant out in California, has 20 years of projected life. They said it can't compete with solar. The, what I call the Walmart award for everyday low price was just won by uh, Dubai. 1.3 cents a kilowatt hour for utility scale solar. And in China, China has said, you know, it's cheaper to put solar on your roof than it is to hook to the Chinese coal fired grid. It's over. The age of fossil is over. We have the opportunity now to solve the crises facing us, whether it be the COVID crisis whether it be the climate crisis, whether it be the crisis of how are we going to live together, our choice now is what kind of a world do we want to create? What kind of a world do we want to leave to our children? And this is the, the thesis of our book, A Finer Future, Creating an Economy in Service to Life, where we walk through how did we get into the mess we're in and then how do we solve it. And we talk about how do we transform finance, corporations, energy, agriculture, and what are the policy measures that we need. But it really starts with you. It starts in your home. It starts in your community. It starts with the choices that you make every day. Where does your energy come from? Where does your food come from? What kind of a community do you want to live in? We are in a time of tremendous transformation. And when, when people ask me, is there hope? Are we going to make it? I like to tell the story of the caterpillar. Caterpillar is a an extractive little creature. It crawls along eating leaves until one day it stops. Not unlike us, we have now stopped. The caterpillar transforms itself. It creates the chrysalis. And in this chrysalis, it literally melts. It becomes what are called imaginal cells. Have you ever broken one of these things apart? There's no worm in there. There's no butterfly in there. It's just goo. And if our world feels a little gooey right now, maybe it is because we are in the midst of the most profound transformation, perhaps 
of humankind ever. If you're patient, something starts to emerge. And it's very different. When the caterpillar enters the chrysalis, it had no earthly idea what's fixing to happen to it. And it begins to emerge into something very different. And yes, it's fragile at first. Well, boss David Brower once tried to help the butterfly. It, he broke the chrysalis away. And what resulted was this stunted, crippled little butterfly. It's the fight of breaking out of the chrysalis that gives the butterfly its ability to fly. This, I think, is now the challenge that is before us. Yes, we face enormous threats. Threats that could end humanity as we know it. COVID won't, but climate change could. A warming Earth would destroy much of life on Earth. Life will go on, but we won't be here. And to me, that would be a tragedy. I'm rather sentimental about this human experiment. So let's think like the caterpillar. Now we're in this time of stopping, pausing. Let's build something better. Let's build back better. Let's bounce forward. Let's create the kind of world that you would really want to live in. Thank you. Thank you, Hunter. That was awesome. Okay, well, uh, I don't think we have any questions yet. Does anybody have any questions they want to ask? Got plenty of time. Start a James mentioned here. Ray Archuleta. There, there are so many great minds working in this field of regenerative agriculture. And you know, I, I pick out a couple just because time is limited. But uh, any of these, uh, David Montgomery is another great writer on this. And take the time, read these folks, and then think about how it is that the, the choices you want to make. What kind of food do you want to eat? What kind of farmer do you want to be buying from? Myself, you know, when I have the opportunity, I, mean, I raise my own beef. But when I want eggs, I literally walk right next door to the little general store in the community that I live in, and I buy eggs that were raised a quarter mile down the road. I buy milk that was produced by a local dairy. These are choices. Yeah, I could go to the Kroger market and buy milk that's been trucked halfway across the country, but I'd, I'd much rather support the farmers and ranchers here in my community because. When times are tough, I know they're going to be here. I don't know that the big guys are always going to be here. So I have a quick question for you. So you said soil carbon is the key to farm profit. Now, how do I convince farmers around here of that? <laughs> I mean, I, they probably already know, but I think a lot of farmers have have issues with making these changes because they're afraid it won't be profitable and so like how do you convince them that it's worth it and worth the time and worth the investment there are several ways one is the, the best way to talk to a farmer is to have a farmer talk to them so bring someone like a gabe brown to town and have him sit down with some of the local farmers and walk through what he did and why or a Will Harris, or a Ray Archuleta. And let them ask all the questions. Let them kick the tires. And then try it. Many farmers are on the verge of bankruptcy. They don't really have a choice. This was Gabe's situation. He was going broke. He was looking at, at selling the farm. And he said, I'll try anything. So he did. When they start to cut their cost, and this is what Gabe did, he just, what he did was, how can I cut my cost? When he started to cut his cost, he, his profits started to go up. It was a later recognition 
that what drove it all was carbon in the soil. Those of us who raise livestock, we're not livestock ranchers, we're grass farmers. The health of our livestock comes from the grass. The health of the grass comes from the carbon in the soil. And actually it comes from the mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, when you watch Gabe's movie, he shows the difference between his neighbor's farm soil, which is sort of gray, and his, which is almost black. He said, your soil ought to look like black cottage cheese. And that is, that's the basis of the health of your productivity. And it is your productivity that's the basis of your profitability. Okay. Converting from, <coughs> excuse me, con <coughs> conventional to regenerative is, is expensive. No, it can be if you do it in a way that requires you to buy a lot. If you do it in a way that enables you to cut your cost and you do it in a planned sequence, then it you're saving money at every step along the way. This was Gabe's experience. What is expensive or what can be expensive is converting from chemical farming to organic. And if you convert to organic, you can charge more for the crops three years down the line. But in those three years, it's hard. Now, the second answer to the how do you get farmers to convert is you pay them to do it. We ought to be paying farmers to sequester carbon. And there are some efforts to do this underway. There's a little company called Nori, a company called Indigo Agriculture. These are voluntary carbon markets. Uh, at Natural Capitalism, we run a little effort called the Colorado Carbon Fund. Mm -hmm. We sell license plate, clean energy license plates. The money from that goes to support regenerative agriculture. But we, this ought to be a statewide policy. And now in California, they're starting to do this. They're starting to pay farmers for proven increase in carbon in the soil year on year. And, you know, I had never tested the carbon in my soil. I always thought of my soil as somewhat poor. Uh, a, a marvelous woman here set up a citizen science initiative, got a small grant to pay to enable all of us to have our soil tested for nutrients, for carbon, for fungal content. And I won the Humongous Fungus Award for the highest mycorrhizal content and the highest carbon content of all of the 35 operations that are part of this. It's like, wow, I hadn't realized. So get your soil tested and see how much carbon is there. Then try some measures. Try introducing animals to your ground. What Gabe did, you know, he planted his cover crops and then he had to clear the cover crops so that he could drill seed his corn soybeans. He turned animals out in the winter to eat the cover crops. He said, wow, now I don't have to grow hay to feed them. Gabe said, I'd rather sign the back of the check than the front of the check. Okay, well, do you want me to read some of the questions here we got off the Q&A? Sure. Uh, Dave Ernst said 1% organic matter, $750 worth of water and nutrients. Yeah, this, these are the sorts of numbers that Gabe is coming up with. The sequence of how the land is regenerated versus via the animals on the land. Remember, the health of land comes from the mycorrhizal fungi, from the, the biological activity in the soil. That is fed by the carbon that comes from the biomass above ground and from the manure and from the urine. So if you have animals on the ground squashing 
the biomass into the soil, fertilizing it. That feeds the microbiological community. That's what gives you the healthy fungal community, and technically it's called glomalin, that mineralizes the carbon into the soil, which is then available for the plants to take it up. If you will, this is a circular economy of the soil. But without the animal impact, it's very hard to keep that circular economy going. Now, yes, you can get manure from somewhere else, put it on your ground, mechanically till it in, all of that has a cost. If you just turn the animals out and do this in a planned way where you are observing how many animals, for how long, on which piece of ground, every piece of ground is different. So try it, assume you're wrong, watch for the sign that you may have done it wrong, and then correct. And test this over time so that you come to know what healthy soil is for your piece of ground. Property with invasive weeds, uh, yeah. I took over the management of a thousand acres of ground in the Roaring Fork Valley of Colorado. It, uh, it had been a ranch and then actually John Denver bought the ground to create a foundation. The people working for him were of the belief that humans are evil, nature is spiritual, and therefore what they should do is do nothing to the land, just let it alone. Now that may work if you have intact wilderness and you have an intact ecosystem. It didn't work so well on the Windstar. And over 20 years time, the land started to erode badly. Noxious weeds came in. There was a contest in Pitkin County of uh, who could bring the most thistle into the Pitkin County landfill. We literally bailed thistle on this thousand acres of ground. Uh, we then said, you know, don't give us the award, give it to the Boy Scouts who brought in some plastic bags of thistle. But uh, we had a lot of noxious weed. We had knapweed, we had uh, four or five kinds of thistle. We had uh, toad flax, you know, all sorts of nasties. We sectioned the area off with electric fence and turned out the cows. And in two years time, we had wetlands coming back. We had endangered species that hadn't been seen on the ground for 20 years and the weeds were in retreat. Now, you can't do it all in two years time, but you can do a heck of a lot. And it depends again on each piece of ground is different. So set out your holistic plan. If you need to know how to do this, take one of the online courses from Savory Institute and figure out what it is that your holistic goal is. What are you trying to achieve? What are the tools you have to work with? And set out a plan. Try it, test it, adjust it, and you will become a regenerative farmer rancher. Small is beautiful. Yeah, E.F. Schumacher wrote that book. Uh, Fritz had been the chief economist of the British Coal Board, and he went to India and studied with Gandhi and wrote the book, Small is Beautiful, Economics as if People Mattered. And he talked about Buddhist economics, economics that starts with caring about people. Uh, I highly recommend you read that book. We've got a question here. Um, how can we really enhance the farmer profession so young folks want to do it? <laughs> many, many ways. Uh, as I said with uh, Chef Ann, start in the schools or uh, Stephen Ritz. Let the kids start growing food in the schools. There's a great group, uh, Young Farmers Union that helps young people afford to get onto land. There's another program, uh, 
woofer world organic farm where young people can go and apprentice on organic farms around the world. But ultimately in our communities, we need to set up funding mechanisms that enable young farm entrepreneurs to be able to get capital at affordable rates. Here in the Boulder Valley, we have a program called SOIL, Slow Opportunities in Investing Locally, created by a marvelous man named Woody Tash, who's the author of the book Slow Money. Woody contacted a bunch of us and said, uh, would we each put in $250 a year? Some people put in more. We pool that money, we meet every month, and we get proposals from young farmers in the area, and we loan them money at zero interest. So this is not an investment on our part. This is a way of building agricultural community in our area. And it, um, it works every month. Some young farmer comes, uh, they want 5,000 to set up a cricket farm to produce cricket meal. Or the, the latest one were, is a young couple who have a dairy and a beef herd and they needed to build a new building. Uh, they have the opportunity to rent a piece of ground so they can expand their herd. And they farm with horses. Uh, there were a couple of young men who are putting together a microgreens greenhouse. A young man who's doing grass-fed beef who wanted to buy a trailer so he could get his steers to market. And so in, in every instance, we, we challenge them. We have a committee that looks over their business plan, their financials, and then we do or don't make a loan to them. The, as the money is repaid, that the loan fund grows. As we get more members, we get more money into it. And this is a way that people who otherwise would have no connection with the local agricultural scene are able to uh, get to know farmers. The farmers that are, that are doing this now have a customer base that knows them. We've loaned them money. We all have a stake in the success of their operation. And we're circulating the money locally in our community. When in your next session, when you have uh, Moose Schumann, and please give Moose my warmest regards. Uh, Moose and I worked together years ago and we now teach together at the Bard MBA. He will describe to you the value uh, to the economy of keeping money local. Enormous impact. If you think about all the stuff you buy from outside the community, that money's gone. It can never help build your community. If you spend it locally, that money turns over in the local community and actually increases itself. It's called the economic multiplier. Yes, love it. Do you want me to read another question off the Q&A here? Okay. Sure. We're seeing more land in Illinois purchased by larger companies that don't live on the land or even in the community. How do we promote regenerative agriculture when these companies treat the land more as an extractive endeavor, maximizing yearly profits rather than long-term management? That's a tough one. You, best case, you have a chat with the people running the company. So we're starting, as I mentioned, we're starting to see some companies shifting to regenerative agriculture. General Mills is one of the biggest. And see if you can convince them that even if they are going to manage this ground distantly, they do so in responsible ways. Worst case, you say to them, you know what? We're not gonna buy your product. And you organize a consumer boycott. Boycotts scare the hell out of big companies. You say, look, we're, we're gonna go on, um, on the interwebs and tell people what you're doing and how you're destroying our community. Now, that ladder is your big stick. Start with conversation. Start with trying to educate them. Also, another good tool is local land trusts. 
start buying up farmland as it becomes available and providing it to small local farmers. Here in the Boulder Valley, the county and the city of Boulder both have massive open space bought with public tax money, which they lease out to local farmers. And both the city and the county now are committed to regenerative agriculture. And so when they consider who it is they're going to lease to, they ask, are you ranching, farming regeneratively? Great, okay, I've got another one here. So you provided an example of a regenerative farmer who had many different income streams from a, very, a variety of crops and animals. This sounds like a lot of work for a farmer compared to monocropping. Do you anticipate any resistance to such efforts because of the complexity of pursuing such diverse income streams? Gabe, both Gabe and Will Harris got into these diverse income streams because at each instance they saw a way to increase their profitability. In, in both cases, they started with monocultures. In Will's case, it was monocultural beef. In uh, Gabe's case, it was corn and soybeans. And Gabe was going broke and Will wasn't very happy with his returns. And so they started adding these other products as they started doing the regenerative agriculture and realizing that, oh, I could do this too. Now, interestingly, Will Harris went to pasture raising chickens because he could sell them at a premium price and he could sell the pasture raised eggs. When he started this, he had, you know, every now and again in the area, somebody would see a bald eagle. There was one pair of bald eagles in the Bluffton area. He now has 80 pair of bald eagles eating his chickens and he's losing thousands of chickens to these bald eagles. You know, he says if everybody in the area pasture raised their chickens, the eagles would spread out. But he said, you know, we're told I'm supposed to tithe to the church. I'm tithing to nature. And then he said, tourists would like to see bald eagles. So we built some cabins on the place and now he has a thriving, well, he did have before COVID, agro-tourism endeavor. So he set up a restaurant where he's selling his products. And again, each of these steps was an incremental step because he saw it as a way to increase his profitability. Both of these farmers now realize that this is the way that they are resilient against changes in the commodity supply chain if all you're doing is selling one product. Yep, okay. So maybe one more question, um, unless you have one you wanna answer. I've got one. Okay, so James is asking, what was your biggest influence in your life? Or who, who or what? <laughs> so many people. And still today. My mother worked in the coal fields with John L. Lewis, helping to organize coal miners. My dad helped mentor Cesar Chavez and Martin King. They were around the house as I was growing up. So I'm, I'm not sure I had a choice in all of this. I uh, was blessed to be able to work with, uh, well, with E.F. Schumacher Fritz, with uh, David Brower, with uh, Dana Meadows, the author of Limits to Growth, I work now with John Fullerton, who wrote the paper Regenerative Capitalism. I have a vast array of friends and colleagues around the world, all of whom are influences to me. Uh, James Holtman says Joel Salatin. Yeah, I had the opportunity to meet Joel a number of years ago. Joel runs Polyface Farms that uh, Michael Pollan wrote about. Uh, I was at a fancy event, uh, put on by the Savory Institute, and my job was to chat up a Saudi prince and try to get him to donate to Savory. And uh, Alan's wife, Jody, said, Hunter, have you ever met Joel Salat? And I went, no. I didn't talk to the Saudi prince at all. Joel and I spent the whole evening talking. So if you ever get the opportunity to meet Joel Salat, and he, he's a great one. Okay, well, 
any other last nuggets for us or <laughs> any other questions you want to answer that you see? Yeah, I'm just uh, flipping through. I hadn't realized that we had uh, the question area. Yeah, I think we got to most. We got most of them. And some the, I can back to people, so. The real message is we are at an epic moment in history. You will tell your children, your grandchildren, what you did in this time of COVID. We are spending trillions of dollars to rebuild our economy. What kind of an economy do we want to buy with all that money? Now is the time to tell your Congress people, your local representatives. I've been asked by um, the Colorado governor to help with the, the group that's going to put forth the plan for rebuilding Colorado. And so we're having, a, literally, we're having the first meeting tomorrow on energy. A couple weeks after that, we'll be on agriculture. And our commitment is to build back better. Build back we're not going to go back to normal. And I'm not sure we would have wanted to if we could. We have all the technologies to solve all the problems facing us. Let's build that finer future. I'm with you 100%. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. I'm going to pause or stop.